You're on, Andrew. Hi, everybody. We are live. What a view. Wow, could you guys see that coastline? It's a little difficult to see, but below the marine layer, there is a Pacific Ocean, the San Simeon Harbor. And we are up here at Hearst Castle. You guys know about Hearst Castle, right? There it is, right behind me. But uh, we're here to talk about William Randolph Hearst, the guy that lived here in this great big house on the hill. We're also here to talk about the animals of San Simeon. And my name is Andrew. I will be your guide here today. I'm a tour guide at Hearst Castle. And uh, I will be wearing my mask for the duration of the video here today. So I'll, I'll try to uh, speak a little louder so you can hear me through the mask. How does that sound, everybody? Yeah? Okay, good. So this is always a good place to start. We're overlooking that coastline. We're going to head down there a little later to hear about the sea otters of Morro Bay. Uh, Mar Mariana will be uh, showing us that. But we wanted to show you the castle, not only because of the story of who lived here, but also the animals that lived here. There was a lot of different animals that lived uh, in the zoo, the private zoo of William Randolph Hearst. There's a lot of wildlife that lives here even today. And there is even animals in the artwork here. Now, what is the most famous animal that you think of when you think of Hearst Castle? Maybe you've taken a tour here in the past and there's a certain animal that you almost always see on the side of the road, right? Okay, you guys know all about the zebras. Are you guys with me? Okay, yeah, the zebras of San Simeon. That's a that's a interesting topic because there's over a hundred zebras living on the Hearst Ranch today, but they are the descendants of the zebras that were once a part of William Randolph Hearst's menagerie. So when you took a trip to Hearst Castle, let's say 90 years ago, you're coming to visit, it's the 1920s, the 1930s. And as you come up to the hill, you certainly are greeted by this big castle in the background, but you would have also been greeted by Mr. Hearst's zoo animals. And that was always a big treat for the guests. A lot of people came here just to see those animals. There's a story of the astronomer Edwin Hubble. And when he came to the ranch, he spent all his time just admiring the animals in the zoo. There's a story of when Winston Churchill was driving up through the ranch and he was greeted by a herd of giraffe. He said that the giraffe blocked his car on his way up here. So the animals just kind of had free reign of the place. It was like you were entering a, a wild animal park. Here's a picture of both the giraffe and also looks like some reindeer there, guys. Okay, now, Mr. Hersey also had lions, lions in his private zoo. He was crazy about lions. And there's famous stories of these lions because they were very loud. They were known to keep some of the guests up late at night uh, with their roars. And I mentioned we would show you animals in the artwork, right? Well, the oldest art object we have here is an Egyptian goddess named Sekhmet. Guess what? She's also a lion. Well, technically speaking, she's half lion and half human. And it's kind of interesting, whenever Sekhmet changed into her lion form, that's when you knew to look out for her. That's when she was kind of on the war path there. But yeah, you see like the lion's head right here. 
That is the oldest object here at Hearst Castle. This Sekhmet carving is over 3,500 years old. Pretty cool. So there was lions in the zoo. There's also lions in the art. Pretty snazzy. But let's get a little closer to the house. Because there's also lions and many other animals in the architectural designs of the house. Do you guys see that teak wood at the top of Hearst Castle? This is the famous teak wood cornice, a little triangular shape there between the two bell towers. And that is imported teak wood from Thailand. But if you get a closer look, Let's see, we're kind of staring into the sun right now. But maybe if we could get below that sunlight. There's even animals hand carved out of that teak wood up above us. And there's a lot of mythological creatures. There's a lot of creatures that you would have seen in the zoo. Certainly creatures that you would have seen in the ocean. Let's look at the tiles below us. Okay, mythological, yes, that is a lion. This is a dragon. I like the rabbit right here. Julia Morgan designed these tiles. Julia Morgan, our architect. And she kind of had a, a whimsical way of enhancing Mr. Hurst's gardens with these designs. This one is kind of a sea creature. It looks almost like a dolphin, right? So yeah, you can see there's animals all around us, even in the tiles. That's incredible. I like that bird. Okay, now, what about animals in the pond? Sometimes we could see fish. Yes, I see the fish today. There they are. Wow, that's beautiful. It's very calm today. What do you guys think? So I'm gonna show you the ranch. A good view of Mr. Hurst's backyard, the Santa Lucia mountain range. And that is where Mr. Hurst would have been riding horseback. That was a very popular activity here, riding horses on the range. And a lot of the visitors remember these horse rides because they would go out for hours and hours, miles and miles. There's Mr. Hurst with his good friend, Poncho, the cowboy. And Mr. Hurst, he was kind of an old cowboy at heart. He's the one on the left. What do you guys see in the background? On the right of this old black and white photo, there's the house, there's Hurst Castle, the bell tower in the background. So William Randolph Hurst, he had been coming here since he was a boy. That's how long he had been riding horses here. But even like in his retirement years, in his 50s and his 60s, He's, he's going to be riding horses way out there on those trails, the old hillside. Okay, what were some of the other animals? Well, we haven't talked about the dogs yet, but Mr. Hurst, he had, he had numerous dogs in his kennels. You got to have dog kennels, right? If, you, if you're going to have a zoo, you got to have some dog kennels. Well, his favorite dog breed was Dachshund. Here he is with his buddy. That was, a, that was his terrier named Buddy, but there was dozens of Dachshunds that lived here at Hearst Castle. And there's a lot of stories about what would happen with those Dachshunds because, well, they were a big feature during movie time. We're gonna head to the movie theater and kind of show you what was going on there. 
but I wanted to give you folks another chance to see that teak wood above us. This might be a better angle. Yeah, that wood portion at the top of the house. There's more exotic animals staring down at us from above. They're almost like the protectors of the castle. That's pretty cool, I like that. So if you were visiting Mr. Hurst and he invited you into the movie theater, maybe you were sitting in the front row and on your lap would be seated a dachshund, yes. Now, this is a picture of uh, all the movie stars that like to come and visit Mr. Hearst. He had a lot of friends from Hollywood. And when he was producing movies, they would show those films in his own personal movie house. And it kind of looks like one of those old movie palaces you see like in Hollywood, you could think of the Chinese theater, the Egyptian theater. Here at Hearst Castle, we have a Greek theater. It's got some interesting design elements from Greek mythology. But if you're sitting in the front row of this theater, you see the lady on the right? That's the silent film star, Marion Davies. And she's holding a dachshund. Next to her, another legend of silent cinema, that's Charlie Chaplin. Have you ever heard of Charlie Chaplin before? He was one of the most famous movie stars in the world at the time. And these two, they made a lot of silent movies, but later they're gonna have talking pictures. And when they were watching the movies here, They said that it would get a little cold at night. So Mr. Hurst would offer his dachshunds to guests. Everyone would be seated with their own personal lap dog to keep them warm for the duration of the film. That's a good heating system, right? Your own personal dachshund. Well, he had so many dogs in the kennels, everyone seated here would have had their own personal dog. And then if you grew attached to that dog, Mr. Hurst might even let you take it home with you. Pretty good for a parting gift, wouldn't you say? I mentioned it was a Greek theater. There's a lady, she's called a karyotid. She's covered in gold, gold leaf. Pretty fancy, karyotids are popular in Greek mythology. That was a design by the architect, Julia Morgan. And there's a wonderful photograph of Miss Morgan feeding the pet elephant. Okay. So there's Julia Morgan on the left, elephants on the right. She was the first female architect in the state of California. That's a pretty big deal, I would say. But the elephants, they, they were certainly popular. The lions, the giraffes. Mr. Hearst had almost every kind of exotic creature you could think of and certainly from every continent in the world. He even had five polar bears, not one, but five. Five polar bears living here at San Simeon. It does get over 100 degrees here in the summer, so they might have needed a lot of ice to keep those polar bears happy. One of them was named Goofus, Goofus the polar bear. But these polar bears will later end up at the San Francisco Zoo. So that's another legacy of the Hearst family, a lot of the animals ended up fr going from San Simeon to the great zoos of the West Coast, LA, San Francisco, the San Diego Zoo. But if you grew up here in Slow County, you're familiar with some of the local wildlife down near Morro Bay, 
you certainly see a lot of the marine creatures. And uh, my friend Mariana, she's going to tell us all about the sea otters of Morro Bay. We'll uh, send the feed down there. But thanks for joining us at Hearst Castle. That was a lot of fun to talk about uh, uh, the animals that used to live here. And keep in mind, even today, there's still animals living here. Foxes, squirrels, wild boar. And we even have some Barbary sheep from the north coast of Africa. Typically, you see them in the Atlas Mountains. But we've got these udads, the Barbary sheep, living on this hillside today. Uh, there's even uh, a certain mountain goat, I think it's called a tar, living way up on those mountain, those mountain tops out there. Those particular mountain goats only live in the Himalayas, but maybe they're right at home here on the ranch as well. So some of the animals did stick around, most famously the zebra. And a lot of those zebra today are living by Highway 1. Uh, when you're going up and down the coast, that's how, that's how you really get to connect with the wildlife of our, of our state parks, because you could see the elephant seals. You could see the sea otters, especially when you're right there by the Moro Rock. So let's uh, learn all about those sea otters. I'll uh, give you one last wave goodbye. If we could flip the camera around. Thanks everybody, that was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed that. It was my pleasure uh, showing you around Hearst Castle today. I hope to see you on many more of these uh, virtual tours. Pretty cool stuff. Why, hello everyone. Thank you, Andrew. That was awesome. I learned so much about all of the Hearst Castle uh, animals. I'm even wearing my animal mask right now, and I have a zebra that you're talking about, too, and even a lion on my mask. Oh, my that gosh. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> Thought it would be fitting to wear an animal mask because we're talking about animals today. So that was an it. awesome <laughs> presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, my name is Mariana, and I am a park interpreter specialist for California State Park. So just like Andrew, I work for this symbol that's located on my hat. And there's no one around me, so I'm going to quickly show you my face, give you a big smile. <laughs> so you have an idea of what I look like. There we go. So right now, I am located at Morro Bay State Park. I'm about 20 miles south of Hearst Castle, and I even have a map to show you exactly where I'm at. Here we go. So on your top left, you can see that is Hearst Castle. That is exactly where you just came from. Pretty cool. That is where Andrew is located. And if you traveled about 20 miles south, maybe a little bit more than that, you'll end up at Morro Bay State Park. And you can see where Morro Bay is on this map. A little bit below, travel down Highway 1. Beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean. Neat. And I have an awesome view of Morro Bay right behind me. You can check it out. It's a there's overcast, so it's kind of difficult to see far away, but you can see more rock straight ahead. You have a glimpse of the beautiful bay water. It's low tide, so you can even see uh, some of that grassy island right here. The Morro Bay is home to many, many different types of animals and plants, and today we're going to be focusing on one special marine mammal one of my favorites, the Southern Sea Otter. So what is a marine mammal? Hmm, well, marine means ocean, and a mammal is a warm-blooded animal. 
If you take your finger and you point it to yourself, you are a mammal. We are mammals, but we're not a marine mammal because we don't live out in the ocean. Marine mammals get all of their food source from the ocean. That's how we know it's a marine mammal. And the southern sea otter that we're going to learn about is a marine mammal. Pretty cool. And here's a close-up of, of the beautiful southern sea otter. This is a typical resting position of our sea otters. Pretty cute, right? And these amazing marine mammals are actually related to an animal that you might see in your very own backyard called a skunk. Can you believe that? This marine mammal, the southern sea otter, is related to skunks and even weasels. And I have a picture of all three of those animals. The top left, the southern sea otter, that's the animal that we're gonna dive in and learn a little bit about. Right below it is your skunk. I bet many of you have seen skunks. Pretty cool, how could they be related? That's really fascinating. And the image to your right is of a weasel. We have weasels here in Morro Bay, but it's pretty neat if you can see one in the wild. They're very sneaky and they don't like to be near humans. And so we don't get to see them frequently, but they are there. But all of these animals are part of the same family. We call that family Mastilidae. It's kind of a hard word to pronounce. So I'm gonna say it again. These animals are part of the Mastilidae family. Awesome. And to get to know how this amazing marine mammal lives in such a cold environment, we are gonna be doing an activity that requires a piece of paper and a marker or a pen, whatever you prefer. We are going to be building a sea otter and learning how this amazing creature has adapted to living in such cold water. Maybe you don't know what adaptations mean, but that just refers to something an animal has or does that makes it easier to living in their environment. So this sea otter, this marine mammal, lives in the ocean, right? It is a marine mammal. And so they have some cool body parts, like physical adaptations, and they even have behavioral adaptations. So things that they do in order to make it easier for them to live in this environment. So we are going to be building a sea otter by drawing one and talking about all those different body parts and behavior. So all of those adaptations that sea otters have to making it easier to live in their environment. I think we should get started. I don't know about you, but let's get to it. Let's get drawing. And I encourage you to get out a piece of paper and marker as well so we can do this together. All right, let's get started. To start off, let's draw a circle. All right, drawing a circle to represent the head. And I am no artist by any means, but I love to use art as a way to see, to help me understand my surroundings. That's a really cool way of using art as a way of seeing to really get a better understanding of my environment. So we have a circle that represents the head. Let's draw the body of our furry friends. I'm just going to draw kind of like an oval attached to the head. Maybe it kind of looks like an eggplant if you eat the <laughs> eat eggplant. So we have the circle, we have the head. I'm gonna draw some eyes. And small ears, small round ears. Actually, those small round ears, all of those animals that I showed you guys earlier, the skunk, weasel, the southern sea otter, they all have small round ears. It what puts them in the Mastilidae family. Okay, we have eyes, ears, we have a body. Maybe you kind of can see where we're headed. But we're gonna draw a really important 
physical adaptation that the southern sea otter has in order to keep warm in this chilly environment. And that is da 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 fur. The southern sea otter has fur and a lot of it. And I like to draw fur like three little lines of tats, but you can do squiggly lines, you can color it in. Ever reminds you that the southern sea otter has a lot of fur. Unlike other marine mammals like whales, sea lions, harbor seals, the southern sea otter does not have a thick blubber to keep warm. Instead, they have really thick fur, fur that we're drawing right now. And their fur is so dense that it is actually the thickest fur in the entire animal kingdom. Whoa! That's so thick. Think about all of the animals that have fur. Like dogs, cats. Well, the southern sea otter has much more fur than all of those animals that you are thinking of right now. They have about one million strands of hair per square inch of their body. It's kind of hard to picture what a square inch looks like. So I'm gonna take my hand, show you the back of it, and I'm gonna draw an imaginary square inch. Just like that. That's about as big as a square inch. And there's about one million strands of hair per square inch of a sea otter's body. That is amazing. It's amazing how they are adapted to living in this cold environment, in the cold ocean. They have such thick fur, right? The thickest fur in the entire animal kingdom. That is amazing. How about we guess how many strands of hair we have on the top of our hair? Hmm, a thousand? Ten thousand? Ooh, those are pretty good guesses, but there is about a hundred thousand strands of hair on the top of our head. That's right, only a hundred thousand strands of hair. That's pretty small compared to that one million strands of hair per square inch of the southern sea otter body. That is amazing. That's quite a difference, I think, from a hundred thousand strands of hair on the top of our head to the one million strands of hair per square inch of a sea otter. Just imagine if we had one million strands of hair. We would have so much. It'd be, we would look very different. <laughs> and here's a close up of that amazing sea otter fur. Southern sea otters have two different types of fur. They have guard hair, which are those longer strands that you are seeing on your screen. And that helps with waterproofing. So water is able just to run off those hairs. And they have another type of fur called underfur. And underfur is the closest to their skin. So it's really hard to see in this image, but it's there. And it's softer than that guard hair. But both of these are so packed together that the seawater, or this Moro Bay water, doesn't reach the skin of a sea otter. Can you imagine? They spend all of their lives out at sea and then the water doesn't touch their skin. That is amazing. Even if we as humans put wetsuits on and go in the water to protect ourselves from that chilly cold water, we would still feel, we would still feel that cold water. But sea otters, nope, they have really thick fur that keeps them warm all year. And whatever they're doing, they're always warm because of their thick fur. So that is one type of adaptation that sea otters have. Uh, they have that really thick fur. And they also do a behavior adaptation with that fur called grooming. And that's where they take their hands and they rub their bodies all over. I'm doing a little dance to represent. They rub it all over and that actually makes it so that the fur traps air bubbles. And that also provides a barrier between the sea otter skin and that cold ocean water. Pretty amazing that they can just be moving their fur 
and that's actually trapping air. That is such a cool adaptation that sea otters have. And they groom all the time. They groom, they eat. They groom, they rest. They groom, they sleep, and then they groom again. And it's their whole cycle. And they just always groom to help them keep warm in this environment. Let's get back to our drawing. So we have the body and we added fur. What else? I'm thinking we should draw a nose because sea otters have a nose. And I usually just do an upside down triangle. And then I'm gonna draw some circles attached to it to represent the snout of our Southern sea otters. There we go. And on their snout, they have whiskers. Whoa! Let's draw some whiskers. It's a cute little face. I think it's starting to look like a sea otter. Their whiskers are a really important adaptation. This water behind me is murky. It's hard to just use eyesight to navigate in this bay. So sea otters have another way of trying to look for food or just to swim through the murky ocean water. They use their whiskers. That's right, their whiskers. Their whiskers almost act like fingers, allowing them to touch and feel as a way of seeing. Sometimes I like to put my hands on my face to pretend I have whiskers and try to go around using my whisker fingers to feel and kind of figure out what that um, item is. So that's kind of how the Southern Sea Otter uses their amazing whiskers. And they use their whiskers a lot to find food. Sea Otters love to eat. They eat about 25% of their body weight. It's kind of hard to picture how much food 25% of their body weight is. So let's break it down. Sea otters typically weigh between 50 to 70 pounds. But for this example, let's pretend that our sea otter weighs 100 pounds. If a sea otter weighed 100 pounds, they would need to eat 25 pounds of food a day in order to stay warm. They use their food source as an energy to keep up their body temperature. Whoa, 25 pounds of food a day? If you weighed 100 pounds, that is amazing. Humans, like you and me, we eat about three to five pounds a day. And I would like to say a lot of adult humans weigh way more than 100 pounds, and we only eat three to five pounds of food a day, whereas a sea otter that weighs 100 pounds would need to eat 25 pounds of food. So they need to rely on those whiskers a lot. So that's a really cool adaptation that sea otters have. And here's a close up of a sea otter face. Amazing, look at those whiskers, they have so many. Something so fragile looking really helps them navigate in the waters to look for food. And they like, they are carnivores. So they like all of those tasty meats. Sea urchins are examples, snails, crabs. Those are some of their favorite foods that they like to eat. And they can find that in the bay. All right. So we'd had some fur in our drawing and we add some whiskers. Let's go ahead and continue to add some more body parts to our drawing. I'm going to add some paws. There's one and the other one right here. My sea otter is going to be waving to you. Hello. And I'm going to go ahead and draw some feet. But the southern sea otter has something different than the feet that you and I have. They have webbed hind feet. Yeah, just like sea lions. Right? They have webbed hind feet. Why do you think that? Hmm. Maybe it's because they are in the water. Having webbed hind feet makes it easier to swim in the water. 
maybe some of you have experienced the difference of just swimming in the water with your bare feet versus putting on slippers. Well, sea otters don't need to go put on slippers. They already have it, right? They have built-in slippers. They're hind webbed feet. It's a really cool adaptation that the southern sea otter has to living in this environment. It makes it more efficient for them. But fun fact, the southern sea otter is the only animal in the entire world to have paws for hands and webbed hind feet. Pretty cool, right? They use their paws for grooming, looking for food, just like their whiskers, helps them break open the hard shelled animals that they like to eat, like sea urchins, clams, mussels. So use their paws for that and the webbed hind feet help with swimming, make it more efficient. And last but not least, the, uh, the next part of our drawing is a tail. Sea otters have tails, something that many people don't realize because they're kind of hard to see, but they do, they have tails. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that. And tails also help with swimming, just like their hind webbed feet. Well, congratulations because you just built a Southern Sea Otter. Woo! Thank you for joining me on that, on this amazing activity. We created art to get a better understanding of how these amazing marine mammals survive in the cold, murky ocean water. That is awesome. And before we kind of conclude this program, I want to show you one last picture of this other sea otter. And you can see those amazing hind web feet right on this image, right on your screen, and those paws. So cute, the sea otter is resting. They like to rest quite a bit. And now you can see from this picture that both their, their web hind feet and their paws are above the water. And that's because they tend to have less fur on those parts of their body. So more vulnerable to that cold water. So if you ever see sea otters, they might be in this position. Pretty cool. And this other sea otter, we want to do our job in protecting them, and we can do that by picking up after ourselves. And that really just helps everyone, right? Healthy environment, healthy wildlife, and healthy people. And we all want to be healthy. Even if you're not from Moro Bay, you can still help the Southern Sea Otter by just picking up after yourself. Trash is stored in improper areas, can find its way into the ocean. Through the, through the streams and creeks that are near your homes that flow out to the ocean. So just take your time anytime you're outside to check your surroundings and make sure that there is nothing left but your footprints. It's always an important, um, important part of sharing space with wildlife. And if you ever find yourself visiting the Southern Sea Otters, let's be respectful and mindful of their space. Just like us, they get scared when a stranger comes into their home. I would definitely not like somebody I didn't know to just enter my home. Well, the sea otters feel the same way. And so to respect their space, we like to say, stay about five kayak lengths away from a sea otter. And if the sea otter is looking at you, you are too close. But those are two main ways that we can help protect this amazing species. Well, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank you all for joining, uh, joining this awesome virtual junior ranger program where you got to check out Hearst Castle. Whoa, that's such a unique opportunity um, to be able to visit Hearst Castle from your home. Awesome. You guys got to see Hearst Castle and then travel down the coast to Morro Bay State Park. That is what the junior virtual Ranger pro the Junior Ranger programs offer our Castle to Coast programs. And tomorrow, you guys, everyone is going to be so lucky enough to take a tour, a kayak tour with Andrew and, and my coworker, Robin. I'm so excited to check out that Junior Ranger opportunity because I love kayaking and I want to take a kayak tour with Robin too. So that is what's happening tomorrow. Hopefully, I'll get to see you there. 
Um, but if not, have a wonderful rest of your day or rest of your week if we don't see each other again. Hopefully it's beautiful wherever you are. And I'm gonna take a quick scan of this beautiful view that I have before I sign off. Oh, there's a bird that just flew by, a seabird. Okay, well, thank you for having me and hope to see you soon. Yeah, she's doing